Hello, and welcome to the Fighting Moose Podcast. I'm your host and narrator, Jason Hendrickson. This is a podcast where I retell stories, some fictional and some historical, that can be enjoyed by people of all ages. Today, we delve into some Greek mythology with the story, The Slaying of the Minotaur, from the book Tales of Troy and Greece written by Andrew Lang. Yesterday, John and I were on the hunt for some perler beads. If you aren't familiar with what those are, they are little cylindrical beads that come in a variety of colors. With these beads, you can create anything from simple designs like a yellow ball all the way up to a super complicated design like an Iron Man suit. It's pretty fun to create these things, and he is trying to sell some of his creations and start his business empire. Hopefully I can teach him some stuff about economics along the way. Anyway, during our travels yesterday, we went to the local Goodwill store, and while we were looking at the board games, we found one put out by Lego called Minotaurus. We had fun playing it last night, so of course I went in search of a Minotaur story. I hope that you are spending some good quality time together with your family. John and I just completed a 300 piece puzzle the other day and we went looking also for another one to do. For me, I love spending time with my family. Now that the weather is staying consistently nice, in addition to our board games and puzzles, it will soon be time for family bike rides. Maybe I'll have to bring my radio and listen to the podcast while we're riding. Now. Let's turn to today's story. I hope you enjoy. Let's begin. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. The Slaying of the Minotaur Theseus first fastened one end of his coil of string to a pointed rock, and then began to look about him. The labyrinth was dark, and he slowly walked, holding the string down the broadest path from which others turned off to right or left. He counted his steps, and he had taken near three thousand steps when he saw the pale sky showing in a small circle cut in the rocky roof above his head, and he saw the fading stars. Sheer walls of rock went up on either hand of him. A roof of rock was above him, but in the roof was this one open place, across which were heavy bars. Soon the daylight would come. Theseus set the lamp down on a rock behind a corner, and he waited, thinking at a place where a narrow, dark path turned at right angles to the left. Looking carefully round, he saw a heap of bones, not human bones, but skulls of oxen and sheep, hoofs of oxen and shank bones. This, he thought, must be the place where the food of the Minotaur is let down to him from above. They have not Athenian youths and maidens to give him every day. Besides his feeding place, I will wait. Saying this to himself, he rose and went round the corner of the dark, narrow path cut in the rock to the left. He made his own breakfast from the food that Ariadne had given him, and it occurred to his mind that probably the Minotaur might also be thinking of breakfast time. He sat still, and from far away, within, he heard a faint sound, like the end of the echo of a roar, and he stood up, drew his long sword, and listened keenly. The sound came nearer and louder, a strange sound, not deep like the roar of a bull, but more shrill and thin. Theseus laughed silently. A monster with the head and tongue of a bull but with the chest of a man could roar no better than that. The sounds came nearer and louder, but still with a thin, sharp tone in them. 
Theseus now took from his bosom the phial of gold that Medea had given him in Athens when she told him about the Minotaur. He removed the stopper and held his thumb over the mouth of the phial and grasped his long sword with his left hand after fastening the clue of thread to his belt. The roars of the hungry Minotaur came nearer and nearer. Now his feet could be heard padding along the echoing floor of the labyrinth. Theseus moved to the shadowy corner of the narrow path where it opened into the broad light passage, and he crouched there. His heart was beating quickly. On came the Minotaur. Up leaped Theseus and dashed the contents of the open file in the eyes of the monster. A white dust flew out, and Theseus leaped back into his hiding place. The Minotaur uttered strange shrieks of pain. He rubbed his eyes with his monstrous hands. He raised his head up towards the sky, bellowing and confused. He stood tossing his head up and down. He turned round and round about, feeling with his hands for the wall. He was quite blind. Theseus drew his short sword, crept up on naked feet behind the monster, and cut through the back sinews of his legs at the knees. Down fell the Minotaur with a crash and a roar, biting at the rocky floor with his lion's teeth and waving his hands and clutching at the empty air. Theseus waited for his chance when the clutching hands rested, and then thrice he drove the long sharp blade of bronze through the heart of the Minotaur. The body leaped and lay still. Theseus kneeled down and thanked all the gods and promised rich sacrifices and a new temple to Pallas Athene, the guardian of Athens. When he had finished his prayer, he drew the short sword and hacked off the head of the Minotaur. He sheathed both his swords, took the head in his hand, and followed the string back out of the daylit place to the rock where he had left his lamp. With the lamp and the guidance of the string, he easily found his way to the door, which he unlocked. He noticed that the thick bronze plates of the door were dented and scarred by the points of the horns of the Minotaur, trying to force his way out. He went out into the fresh early morning. All the birds were singing merrily, and Mary was the heart of Theseus. He locked the door and crossed to the palace, which he entered, putting the key in the place which Ariadne had shown him. She was there, with fear and joy in her eyes. Touch me not, said Theseus, for I am foul with the blood of the Minotaur. She brought him to the baths on the ground floor and swiftly fled up a secret stair. In the bathroom, Theseus made himself clean and clad himself in fresh raiment which was lying ready for him. When he was clean and clad, he tied a rope of Byblus round the horns of the head of the Minotaur and went round the back of the palace, trailing the head behind him, till he came to a sentinel. I would see King Minos, he said. I have the password. Androgius. The sentinel, pale and wondering, let him pass, and so he went through the guards and reached the great door of the palace and where the servants wrapped the bleeding head in cloth that it might not stain the floors. Theseus bade them lead him to King Minos, who was seated on his throne, judging the four guardsmen that had been found asleep. When Theseus entered, followed by the serving men with their burden, the king never stirred on his throne, but turned his gray eyes on Theseus. My lord, said Theseus, that which was to be done is done. The servants laid their burden at the feet of King Minos and removed the top fold of the covering. The king turned to the captain of his guard. A week in the cells for each one of these four men, said he, and the four guards who had expected to die by cruel death were led away. 
Let that head and the body also be burned to ashes and thrown into the sea, far from the shore, said Minos. And his servants silently covered the head of the Minotaur and bore it from the throne room. Then at last Minos rose from his throne and took the hand of Theseus and said, Sir, I thank you, and I give you back your company safe and free. I am no more in hatred with your people. Let there be peace between me and them. But will you not abide with us a while and be our guests? Theseus was glad enough, and he and his company tarried in the palace and were kindly treated. Minos showed Theseus all the splendor and greatness of his kingdom and his ships and great armories full of all manner of weapons. The names and numbers of them are yet known, for they are written on tablets of clay that were found in the storehouse of the king. Later in the twilight, Theseus and Ariadne would walk together in the fragrant gardens where the nightingales sang, and Minos knew it and was glad. He thought that nowhere in the world could he find such a husband for his daughter, and he deemed it wise to have the alliance of so great a king as Theseus promised to be. But, loving his daughter, he kept Theseus with him long, till the prince was ashamed of his delay, knowing that his father, King Aegeus, and all the people of his country were looking for him anxiously. Therefore he told what was in his heart to Minos, who sighed and said, I know what is in your heart, and I cannot say you nay. I give to you my daughter as gladly as a father may. Then they spoke of things of state, and made firm alliance between Snosis and Athens while they both lived, and the wedding was done with great splendor, and at last Theseus and Ariadne and all their company went aboard and sailed from Crete. One misfortune they had. The captain of their ship died of a sickness while they were in Crete, but Minos gave them the best of his captains. Yet by reason of storms and tempests, they had a long and terrible voyage, driven out of their course into strange seas. When at length they found their bearings, a grievous sickness fell on a beautiful Ariadne. Day by day she was weaker, till Theseus with a breaking heart, stay the ship at an isle but two days' sail from Athens. There Ariadne was carried ashore and laid in a bed in the house of the king of that island, and the physicians and the wise women did for her what they could. But she died with her hands in the hands of Theseus, and his lips on her lips. In that isle she was buried, and Theseus went on board his ship and drew his cloak over his head, and so lay for two days, never moving nor speaking, and tasting neither meat nor drink. No man dared to speak to him, but when the vessel stopped in the harbor of Athens, he arose and stared about him. The shore was dark with people, all dressed in mourning raiment, and the herald of the city came with the news that Aegeus the king was dead, for the Cretan captain did not know that he was to hoist the scarlet sail if Theseus came home in triumph, and Aegeus, as he watched the waters, had descried the dark sail from afar off, and in his grief had thrown himself down from the cliff and was drowned. This was the end of the voyaging of Theseus. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Fighting Moose Podcast. Please join us next time as we read another exciting story. Today's music was provided by the artist Grapes, and the audio clips were provided from NASA. For more information to download and or listen to audio or materials from all our recordings or to contact us, please visit www.thefightingmoose.com or you can follow the links in the show notes. 
If you enjoy the podcast, please leave us a review wherever you get your podcasts and tell a friend. Lastly, don't forget your mission for today and every day is to try and do a random act of kindness every day. Mission complete, Houston. After uh, serving the world for over 30 years, the space center turned its place in history and it's come to a final battle.